all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. And now, your host for today's program, Dale Throneberry. And welcome to Veterans Radio. My name is Dale Throneberry. I was a Chief Warrant Officer, Helicopter Pilot in the United States Army Aviation, 1969, is uh, when I got to do my overseas duty. I want to welcome you to our program today. We're really excited to have you on board. Uh, we've got two great guests. Uh, coming up first is going to be uh, Raymond Tarabusi, and Raymond is a 97-year-old D-Day veteran who's going to be talking a little bit about his experiences uh, in Europe and uh, his anticipation, I guess you could say, in training before he ended up going uh, into D-Day. And then in the second half of the program, we've got our foreign analysis expert, uh, Rebecca Grant, and she's going to be here to answer your questions. And actually, if any of you do have a question today, you can give us a call here on Veterans Radio. The number is 734-822-1600, 734-822-1600. Before we get into talking with Ray, i got to announce, uh, you know, thank our guests, or thank our sponsors, excuse me, uh, can't do the program without our sponsors. So I want to make sure we mention uh, Legal Help for Veterans, specializing in veterans' disability claims. Call Legal Help for Veterans at 800-693-4800 or go to their website. That's LegalHelpForVeterans.com. The National Veterans Business Development Council, better known as NVBDC, is the nation's leading third-party authority for certification of veteran-owned businesses. For more information, you can go to their website, that's nvbdc.org, or give them a call at 888-237-8433. The Charles S. Kettles VA Medical Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan. For more information on that, you can go to va.gov slash Ann Arbor Healthcare. Finally, we want to thank our local veteran service organizations. That would be the American Legion Post 46 and the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter 310 all in Ann Arbor, Michigan. For more information about these organizations and their services, you can go to our uh, website, that's veteransradio.net, slash our sponsors. And we're always looking for new ones, so feel free to go and find out all the information that is there for you. So let's get right into our interview right now. Let me give you a little background on our first guest, Raymond Tarabusi. Raymond uh, was born in Gross Point in that in that area back in 1925. I know all of us can remember that date. I am sure. Attended Southeastern High School, graduated in 1943. Shortly thereafter, he was called up to service with the Army, trained as a combat infantry soldier. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about where he did his training. I uh, served with both the Second Indian Head Division and the famous Ninth Infantry Regiment. So joining us right now on Veterans Radio is Raymond Tarabusi. Raymond, welcome to the program. Thank you very, very much. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure to talk with you. I've had the uh, honor of talking with you a couple of times over the last couple of days. So, uh, Raymond, tell me what it was like, if you, you know, back in 1943 when you got drafted. Okay. I, uh, <clears throat> I turned 18 on July the 14th, and... Uh, a month later, I got my no- I got my notice for the draft board, and I reported to uh, 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 in, in, in to, to camp uh, um, at Fort Wayne. They had the the, the reception center. I was there for about three or four days, and then they uh, examined me, gave me a uniform, and so forth. And then I was the next couple of days. I was put on a train, and I wound up in. Uh, for, in near Fort Worth, Texas, at a place called Camp Walters and Min- Mineral Wells, and I spent twenty <laughs> weeks there as uh, for the training, and uh, that was the premier uh, training center in the United States. And then when you when you got out of there, you were ready for any division that needed a a combat infantryman, and I, that was me. Yeah, it's, then, a, it's uh, an interesting place. I, I came home for about a week. Uh, 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 in 1943, before Christmas, they, then I went back to uh, New Jersey, and from there I was shipped overseas to. Uh, I arrived in Northern Ireland in, in Belfast, and when I got there, I realized I was gonna, I was assigned then to the Second Division. I knew who they were because 
back in uh, in June of 1943. Uh, Detroit had a race riot, and uh, it was a real bad, and the governor called the president, who then had the Army uh, come in, and they were in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and they sent over one regiment. It was a 9th Infantry Regiment. They called the Mass Shoes. And when I see these guys come in town, they were professional. They, they were here about two or three, one day. Well, they were here for about three weeks, but... The ride was over within hours. These guys were no nonsense. They rode up jeeps with machine guns ready, and you know, and and these guys disappeared. And the riot ended as fast as it started, I guess. So then after that, they, uh, I remember these guys. They had an Indian head patch on their shoulder, and I was kind of impressed with these guys. They were professional. They were good, you know. Little did I realize, one year to the day after I met these guys, I would be serving with them in combat on the front lines in Normandy. And that day I sent that I went in was uh, June the 12th, 1944. And, and on, that, uh, on June the 6th when the DJ started, I was at a hotel with a, uh, a group, a, a platoon of, of soldiers, or 40 of us, and it was called the 7th Platoon. And... Uh, and then we got the after there we got the call five days after D Day, we reported uh, to uh, Normandy, and then we went to our division and the regiment, and we found ourselves on the front lines within hours. So I'm 18 years old though, and uh, I'm in the middle of the war, which is about as hot as it could be because it was five days after the invasion. The second division had a mission to uh, spearhead the entire. Uh, invasion of the, of the first army, because the first division and the 29th division took tremendous casualties on uh, on, on June the 6th, and to keep the thing going, they needed a fresh division that was trained. The second division was trained for two years in, uh, in the United States. It was the most trained division the army had. So when I joined these guys, they were they were veterans. And I was a young guy, 18. They probably said, this guy's not going to last long. Well, guess what? After three months, uh, there's only uh, three guys. In the, I, was, I was the last of the platoon that was left there. Three guys left with me. So they were all killed or wounded. So I, after that, I, was, I served in, uh, in June from, uh, for three weeks. And we were on combat patrols, reconnaissance patrols, and we were busy just doing other things. And then, all, then the next as soon as July came around, that was a big month here because by then uh, uh, the war had heated up. Uh, <clears throat> the First Army was in the area of uh, St. Lowe, and Hill 192 was a, was a special place there. And uh, the 9th Infantry, the 23rd and 38th, captured that hill, and uh, that gave us uh, a height advantage where we could see the Germans like they could see us. Now, we had the advantage. So... <clears throat> Then it was July the 15th. Now, that's a day special because that day I was with my partner, and he was a, uh, a BAR man, Browning Automatic Rifle. I was the uh, ammunition carrier. He was my mentor. He was the guy who was going to protect me, I thought. You know? And that same afternoon we were on duty over on, on the hedgerow. He was, he was on there for about three hours. I was five minutes away from relieving him from his post. And just at that time, uh, one, one shot rang out. And a sniper shot, this guy's name was Moose. He was shot between the eyes, and he died in seconds. He didn't suffer at all. After he, he fell down, why we, uh, four of us, picked him up, and we carried him back to the rear. And that's the last time I saw Moose. I only knew him as his first name. I didn't know his last name. And uh, <clears throat> I was hoping after the war I could look up his family, but then I realized later that I, I, I didn't know who he was. Because I, I, during the combat area, you never had a chance to know anybody very well. It was usually it was by a nickname or something like that. Right. You never, really knew, their, you never really knew their real names. Yeah. And so anyway, in a way, he saved my life because had I not relieved him, I would have been the guy that got shot that day. Mm-hmm. I was five minutes away of getting wiped out then. And then shortly after that, another two weeks, <clears throat> well, on, on July the uh, 25th, the uh, entire First Army was uh, getting ready to move out of the, uh, of the spearhead and, and push the Germans back to the border. Well, that day was July the 25th, and the operation was called Operation, uh, uh, 
I forget the name now. Anyway, it was a big operation. And the uh, the first army in the middle, the third army was on the right, and the and the British army, uh, eighth army, eighth army, they were on the uh, left hand side. So on the morning of seven o'clock, the orders came through that we would get ready to go. We, we were ready. Our, our rifles were ready. Bayonets were fixed. And at 7 o'clock in the morning, the artillery, our artillery, opened up for about 15 minutes. It was concentrated, and it was more stuff than I've ever heard in my life. And it was just right in front of us. They busted, After 15 minutes, they stopped firing, and then uh, we got ready to move out. But just then the Germans decided they're going to open their machine guns on there was a machine gun fire for maybe 10 minutes. It was constant. You couldn't even look over the top of the hedge roll. And we just waited. And then finally, when it stopped, about five minutes later, uh, it was quiet, and uh, the, we had our orders to go. I was the first guy over the hedge roll, running across the field, thinking that we were going to see the Germans over there, and this is going to be a head-on collision. It's going to be, you know, bad. Mm-hmm. We get to the other side of the field, and the Germans were gone. They knew something big was coming up, and they got out of there quick. So then I realized that day the, the confrontation never occurred. But there would be another confrontation uh, four weeks later, this time with the Germans, but the results would be deadly. And that day it was an attack, a German pillbox that were there, and we were attacked under a smoke screen. I, I wasn't there then. I had been wounded before that. And uh, our guys killed about 30, 30 Germans. They were wiped out. And after they were getting the position cleared up, the Germans counterattacked, and they came back, and they killed our guys. So what happened that day, each side killed each other. There, was, there were 50 bodies in the field that day. The next morning, our guys went in on patrol, and they found the guys, and Germans had pulled out of their position, and they disappeared. And that was in the, in the area called uh, um, Brittany. And the okay. reason we were there was to attack the city of Brest. Brest was the largest seaport on the Atlantic. Also, it was a key place for the German submarines. And uh, they had three divisions who were there attacking the Germans. Hitler won the whole lot for uh, three months, and in 30 days it was captured. And after it was captured, uh, the city was so demolished, and uh, it, was, it was useless, and, and you couldn't use anything. Then our guys were then sent back to the, uh, where, the, where, the, where they were, the Germans were. They were. By that time, they were in Luxembourg, and they were in Belgium, in the Ardennes. And that was in December of 1944. Uh, and then, on, from then on, on. Uh, I had been hold wounded earlier. <laughs> And it's a long story. Then I went to the hospital. I spent three months in the hospital uh, in England. I was sent back to the division. When I get back there, they decided I, I couldn't go back on the infantry because I had trouble walking. But I had a, had a foot wound that was very severe. And I wound up in a little town called Liège, Belgium. I was there for uh, uh, from there until the war ended in, in, in May. And then the war in Pacific ended in uh uh, in September, and then, anyway, I, I came back home in December of 1945, and that was uh, my Ray, time in service. <laughs> well, hold on, Ray. We're talking with Raymond Taravusi, who uh, was a World War II veteran. He's uh, 97 years old. Yes. And, uh, I, I live answer... alone. I, I drive a car. I could do everything. Everything is fine. My mind is like it was yesterday. It was like <laughs> I remember time, day, and places. But you do. The, you uh, have an excellent part it's, of it's, it's an, ama- it's an amazing result. memory. I wanted you to talk a little bit about the anticipation of D-Day. You know, you mentioned, you know, that you were holed okay. up in, in a hotel, but how yes, long have you been we, in England we training trained, before you went uh, over? Uh, in, in Belfast, Ireland. I spent four, four months there training, and, and then we were assigned to different companies uh, at different battalions. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when the D-Day started, the second division landed D plus one. It was it was one day after D-Day, and then uh, our group was sent to a, a place in uh, Bournemouth in a hotel, and there were forty guys in that ho- our group. It was called the Seventh Platoon, and we waited for orders to come through from Normandy to join the division. So uh, five days later, the orders came, and we we we, we, we got on board these transport boats, and uh, we we found ourselves on Omaha Beach that day, walking up that hill, 
and I still remember those days exactly. And, and the guys that, w- that went that day, there were 40 of us. And it wasn't until after the war was over, and uh, uh, 40 years later, that I, I found out who these guys were. And I met the lieutenant that was in command. He gave me a list of the guys, and my name's on that list with these boys. And of the group that was there, I, after the, I, I, or I came back home, and I, more than half of those guys were killed. Uh, that, that you know, from that one platoon. So, you know, it's just what I had Normandy back in 1944 was really uh, it was it was four months of, of a lot of bad stuff going on. Right. Yes. And you ended up you got wounded pretty quickly, didn't you? Could you tell us I could, about I how you wounded, got wounded? I got wounded on the, the first time was on July the 31st. And what happened? I was going across an open field, a uh, hedgerow. I was in the middle of the field when I, I sensed an incoming artillery shell, and I, I hit, hit the ground as fast as I could, and the shell exploded like about two foot beside me. And, oh. you know, for 88 to, to hit that close is pretty bad. As it was, it, it, uh, it covered me with dirt and smoke, and, I, and it tore my pants off, and I had two hand grenades in my pocket, and that helped him glance part of the shrapnel that hit me that day. So then I went back, I crawled back, I went out, across the field to the medics. They patched me up, and then they sent me back to the unit. And I was there, and five days later, the second time, it was on uh, August the 3rd of 1944. I was out doing perimeter guard duty by myself. It was 8 o'clock in the, in, in the night, maybe 9, and uh, I, I noticed that Two shots went over my head. They were I could I heard the pop pop, and uh, the third shot hit me in the foot. And uh, the sniper, you know, if he had got me the first time, I would have been, I would be here. So I was only I survived by luck. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, it, it, I should have been wiped out two times, but I wasn't. So I think God yeah. spared me. Well, yeah, I, I I I know what you mean. You know, those bullets can come really close sometimes. Oh, and you know, you, you're just amazed that how did they miss me? Oh, it's, well, it was kind of it was it wasn't real bright. It was getting kind of dark, you know. Mm-hmm. And he was probably uh, maybe a couple hundred yards. Uh, I heard no no activity. There was no sound, no nothing, you know. And uh, that's why I was just standing there guarding uh, upright. And and, uh, and the sniper had an easy access to uh, zero in, but he was too far away to get a close shot. I think. Well. And thankfully, you, know, you were lucky, and we're lucky that you're still around to tell these stories. Oh, this you is, know, this and, is what's uh, so important. Well, what happened, when I, when I got back home, uh, I, I, I got a job, I got married, I started a family. For 40 years, I left, I completely forgot the Army. I didn't want to even think about them, and, and I just, just, you know, never thought about them. And then one day uh, in 1982, I see an advertisement in the, uh, uh, the DAV about a uh, uh, reunion. I told my wife, I said, I was, that's my outfit. I was excited. I go to the reunion, and they were in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I get there, and I uh, didn't know anybody because uh, most of the guys I had were, were killed. And uh, I met one guy that was in our company here, but I didn't know him. And from that day on, from uh, 1982 until the year 2000, I got involved with the, uh, the DAV, uh, the VFW, uh, uh, the Purple Heart Association. I'm a life member of all three of those units. Plus the fact I'm, I got involved with the 9th Infantry Regiment, Regiment Association, and I'm the historian for the 9th Infantry Regiment. So that means I know all about them. I know where they, who they were, what, when they were formed. I mean, it's, and so I'm considered an expert about the 9th Infantry. Our, our nickname was called Manchus. Manchu, and our, 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 our title, we call it, Keep Up the Fire is our motto. And the 9th Infantry was formed in 1798, and they were in every, every major war, English, uh, the, the uh, Spanish, uh, uh, you name it. And uh, they were also in the Battle of uh, the Boxer Rebellion. They were in that, that mm-hmm. part of it, too. Well, oh. certainly, oh, your mind the certainly is really sharp. That's that's for sure. One oh, of the reasons that I wanted to have uh, Raymond on our program today is to let people that are in the de- greater Detroit area know that he's going to be honored tomorrow at the uh, Elmwood American House up in Rochester Hills yeah. uh, with a luncheon. And I'm planning on being there myself. Yeah, to get 12 to o'clock. In yeah, it's a big deal. They're having lunch over there. And... Uh, 
like I said, I have a lot of information that would take me an hour to, to talk about it. The thing that's important, I think, though, is the guy I was with. His name was Moose. You know, right. and uh, I, I, I was able to contact his family later on, 40 years later. Uh, we went to their house. We went to the cemetery where he's buried. And at that time, there were five of us that were still that survived the war, and we stood by his grave. And uh, that, to me, is probably the one thing that kicks back in my mind. And uh, I'm involved with the VA now. I, I have a 100% disability. I just got that about a month ago, so I'm all set there. So... I'm able to uh, survive and get along in my civilian life. Well, I, I think it's a it's a great story, Ray, and I, I greatly appreciate your taking the time to come on to Veterans Radio today and talk with us uh, about your 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 story. I, I was curious. You did you go back to? Uh, have you ever been back to Normandy? Yes, I have. I, the first time I went back was uh, in 1988. The Second Division had a reunion. I, we went back to there and to Omaha Beach, walked up the hill, and we, we visited all the places that they were in combat with. So we spent a, uh, about 10 days over there. And then uh, in 1996, I went back the second time. And the second time, I was with three guys I was with, uh, Henry Dorr. He, he went in on D-Day with the engineers. And uh, 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 the other guy was... Uh, 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 I forgot his name right on, but there were three of us. We spent three weeks over there, and we went through uh, Normandy, Brittany. We went through Belgium. Uh, uh, we went to the uh, Val de Bulge, Germany, and we wound up in Czechoslovakia. So I was able to go back the second time, and uh, that was great because we went to back everywhere the second division was. We followed their footsteps, and that included the Battle of Bulge, which was a big deal, and uh, we spent maybe a couple of days over there walking around the area, you know, where they had the, the battle took place. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I did go back, and it was it was very good. And the guys with me were just thrilled to go back again. They died about four, five, or six years later after that. So, had I not gone back when we did, they would have never seen that. They had never, they would never gone back. Right, you never get to see what you actually did, and I think that that's that's what's important. You know, you've got all of. Western Europe is free? Yeah, we were at the uh, Hartbeck Crossroads. You've probably heard of that. And that's a place where the, uh, the Germans met the 2nd Division, and uh, they held them up there. They fought for a week, and, and, and the, uh, it, it was in December of, uh, of 1944 and 45, And uh, that was a big deal. The, the Battle of the Bulge was a major operation for both sides. The Germans surprised uh, the Americans, and the they captured a lot of them, and then, of course, about it lasted about uh, three weeks. Patton came in later on around around Christmas time, and that was at Bastogne. He rescued them there, and uh, mm-hmm. and he went on too. I never met Patton, but we were probably maybe five or ten miles away from him. You could probably feel his aura just being that close. I think. Yeah, I would. Like I said, and I read a lot about him, and like I said, I was a historian also. There's, I know about everything. I know more about the uh, 9th Infantry than any living person today. I well, I'm, gl- I'm grateful that we have. You know, I'm grateful that we have people like you out there that can, you know, that can put down this history and let people know. Because well, there's, you know, I'm probably the last one. No, I don't know of anybody that was in combat at that time that's still alive today. Because you know, the guys that I was there, they were then. Uh, I was 18. They were 23 years old. That makes these guys 102 or three years old. So everybody that I was with in World War II uh, are, are no longer here. Right, and that's I, unfortunate. I, 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 was thinking, is good. I, can, I, I can talk about it. I can tell you time, place is where I was. You know. So I, I'm still the very – and then being a historian for the regiment, that was a big deal because we wrote a book about the United Infantry. It's called Keep Up the Fire. And I was a, a sponsor of getting that book published, and uh, it, it was we, there's 500 books that were published, and they're all gone today. But it's "Keep Up the Fire" by Louis, Louis Costello. Okay, well, Ray, Ray Tarabusi, I am. Thank you very much for being on Veterans Radio. I'm excited to see you tomorrow at your luncheon to honor you at the American House and uh, the Elmwood American House up in Rochester Hills. It's at 2251. West Auburn Road, I believe it's uh, supposed to begin around noon. 
Yeah, I look and forward I'm, to seeing I'm you. I'm sure that you've got a few more stories to tell. As a matter of fact, I have a challenge coin I'm going to give you tomorrow, okay? All right, I'm looking forward to it. Well, Thank you very much, Ray. You'll like it. <laughs> Thank you very much for being on Veterans Radio. Okay, nice talking right. to you. All right, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. All right. There we go. World War II veteran, folks, 97 years old. And as you can tell, he remembers every single minute that he was in the service. And I think that's uh, really kind of, that's awesome to me. And that's one of the things that we try to do here on Veterans Radio is to get these stories out there. So if you're up in the Rochester Hills area tomorrow, see if you could drop into the American house there. It's on uh, West Auburn Road. Maybe you'll get to meet you and you can get, and you can meet Ray because He's been telling me stories for three days solid. <laughs> it's been great. So we're going to take a real quick break. And uh, when we come back, we've got our foreign affairs expert, Rebecca Grant, will be on to answer your questions. And again, that number is 734-822-1600. We'll be right back. You're listening to Veterans Radio. The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat given a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. There have been over 3,400 recipients of the nation's highest award. This is one of them. Staff Sergeant Homer Wise's platoon was pinned down four times. Each time, Wise led a breakout of the platoon. Details after this. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. While his platoon was pinned down by enemy small arms fire from both flanks, he left his position of comparative safety and assisted in carrying one of his men, who had been seriously wounded and who lay in an exposed position, to a point where he could receive medical attention. The advance of the platoon was resumed, but it was again stopped by enemy frontal fire. A German officer and two enlisted men, armed with automatic weapons, threatened the right flank. Fearlessly exposing himself, Wise moved to a position from which he killed all three with his submachine gun. Returning to his squad, he obtained an M1 rifle and several anti-tank grenades, then took up a position from which he delivered accurate fire on the enemy, holding up the advance. As the battalion moved forward, it was again stopped by enemy frontal and flanking fire. Wise procured an automatic rifle and, advancing ahead of his men, neutralized an enemy machine gun with his fire. When the flanking fire became more intense, he ran to a nearby tank and, exposing himself on the turret, restored a jammed machine gun to operating efficiency and used it so effectively that the enemy fire from an adjacent ridge was materially reduced, thus permitting the battalion to occupy its objective. The Medal of Honor series is a production of Veterans Radio. Military veterans touch everyone's life. I'm guessing right now you're thinking of a veteran, a close friend, relative. Maybe it's you. Even the toughest of us sometimes need help but don't know where to turn for support. You don't need special training to help a veteran in your life. We can all help someone going through a difficult time. Learn how you can be there for veterans. Visit VeteransCrisisLine.net. VeteransCrisisLine.net. A message from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. We are back here on Veterans Radio, and uh, we're talking with our foreign affairs expert, and I see now that she is a Fox News contributor. Oh, that's kind of awesome. I'm really excited for her on that. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Grant is the president of Iris Independent Research, a small woman-owned business specializing in defense and aerospace research and consulting with corporate and government clients. Um, She's been a frequent guest on our program. I don't know if 10 years at least, I think. And every time she comes on, I am always so excited to learn new things. And that's what she teaches me is what's going on in the world. So joining me on the air right now is Dr. Rebecca Grant. Welcome back. Dale, it's great to be back. And I'm excited to talk with you about all the events from Russia and Ukraine right on through to China and North Korea. Dale, uh, where do we start? Well, I guess we should start in the Ukraine. And uh, actually, we have somebody on the line had a question for you already. Terrific. So hold on here and let's get Rick from uh, Pinckney, Michigan, with a question about the Ukraine. So, Rick, welcome to Veterans Radio. Hello? I guess he's gone. 
Give us a call back, Rick. <laughs> you missed out on that one. All right. So anyway, yeah, let's do that. Cause I was, I was, uh, you know, checking up on what was happening and, um, you know, it's been a hundred days. Um, I don't know. We won't get, we can get into the politics of the whole thing, but you know, Russia is kind of, they're not having a very easy time of it. Russia's losing, it just has lost so much in this, uh, this completely unnecessary war that Putin has launched. And, you know, we know that just to sum up quickly, you know, they were not able to, to capture Kiev in a rapid drive. They've had to uh, fall back from Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, in the north. And even China, I think, is getting a bit frustrated with them. We've seen NATO close ranks, and Finland and Sweden apply to join the alliance. Maybe we can talk about that later, because it's a huge change in policy for those countries. And then just a a worldwide condemnation of Russia's uh, brutality, their medieval tactics, and their illegal invasion of Ukraine. Um, That said, the military situation is, is a rapidly changing one. You know, Putin has basically is trying to shrink this down into a war he can win by focusing in the east and keeping about half his forces still in the south along the Black Sea coast where he's taken all really but two of the critical Black Sea ports, the main one being Odessa, that's still in Ukraine's hands. So, you know, Russia has uh, really made a huge mistake with this war, but they are uh, just inflicting terrible, terrible casualties and terrible price on Ukraine and on the infrastructure and uh, just so much to talk about there. Well, I, I, I'm curious about, I, I guess I don't understand the logic. I mean, I, I understand, you know, that what Putin wants to do is, you know, is to regain Russia's place in the world and, you know, take back what he thinks is, you know, part of Mother Russia and he's got some, you know, the... the What's the, the term I'm looking for? Some rebels in the you know the eastern part of Ukraine that he was he thought would come to his rescue and you know and, and help out more, but that's that's not working. And it seems like all the the tactical advantages that you would have thought that Russia would have don't don't seem to be playing out very well. That's right. Putin originally wanted to take down the Zelensky government and turn Ukraine into a bunch of little people's republics. Uh, you know, the big shock, uh, really, even to the Pentagon, was how badly Russian forces did in the beginning. It was an overambitious plan, and they didn't execute it well. And they've fallen apart on things that your listeners are going to understand. They don't, Russia does not have a good NCO core, right? They mm-hmm. do not have, they do not pay attention to logistics. They're Communications are very poor. You know, your tank may or may not have a working radio. They do not train to do combined arms where air and ground exercise together for mutual support. So many things interesting were pointed out by a lot of our younger Army officers writing about Russian military doctrine in all the NATO magazines, and it's been exactly in those areas that they have failed. So what Putin has done is shift back to what the Red Army is really good at, and that is leveling cities with artillery. We all saw what happened with Mariupol, but all the smaller towns in the eastern region, in the Donbass towns like Papazna and Rubizhna and on and on and on, what Russia does is they bring up the artillery, they blast these towns to pieces. The Ukrainian civilians have mostly evacuated out prior to the attacks, and then they slowly move up forces. If Russia tries to maneuver quickly, like they did towards Kiev, or like they did at a river crossing about two weeks ago, then Ukraine is usually able to spot that and attack and destroy the maneuver forces. So Russia is inch by inch trying to squeeze right now around a, a city called Severodonetsk, which they have about half of that city. Just yesterday, Ukraine launched a a really quite well-planned counterattack uh, in the part of the city they still control. And so we're watching really to see now where Ukraine will be able to stop the slow, grinding Russian advance in the east and whether Ukraine will be able to shift to the counterattack themselves. 
you know, in, in the news this morning, they you know, were talking about, you know, Kiev being bombed again, or, you know, the artillery shells are coming into there again. And um, I, I can't figure out the uh, the plan. And, I, you know, it doesn't sound like they've got a good plan. Yes, Kiev was attacked by uh, probably about four uh, missiles, po- probably launched from a Russian bomber that launched them out of Russian airspace. Uh, they looked like they were trying to hit a train, uh, either a, a railroad repair yard or some target like that. Putin says it's because the West, the U.S. and NATO are continuing to bring supplies into Ukraine, which actually they have done very successfully for these three months uninterrupted using road and rail primarily to bring supplies down from Poland. So, But it was a surprise. Kiev had not been attacked in about a month. But this is typical. They have launched uh, limited missile strikes on various cities. It was Kharkiv last week and Kiev again. And, and we should just expect that to continue to go on. It is just a pure uh, terror campaign on Putin's part. It is, but it, but it sounds like the, the West is coming, you know, loosely coming to their rescue. I mean, we're not providing troops, but we certainly sound like we're providing materials. And interesting, uh, President Zelensky has never asked for U.S. or Western ground forces. He said they want to fight themselves. What we are providing is a really long list of military equipment. Mind you, still no air power. So it is, we are insisting that, you know, Russia's using medieval tactics and we're letting Ukraine use sort of late 1980s <laughs> tactics and we're right. sending that equipment with them along with they have some really excellent support from the U.S. and NATO in intelligence and in keeping their communications running and keeping their air defenses up. But new things going over this week include the uh, HIMARS, which is a, um, a multiple launch rocket system. It's the newer version, a very road mobile uh, with, uh, depending on what you put in there, it's got a range from, you know, a few kilometers up to a lot. Uh, it's a precision precision weapon. Uh, also, looks like the Army will send some of its Gray Eagles. Those are the Army variant of the Predator drone that made its debut over 20 years ago. And it's a, a good system that's got good intelligence and surveillance capability, plus the ability to use a Hellfire missile against armor or other targets, and also a great ability on the Army Gray Eagle to connect with other systems, whether that's helicopters or ground systems. Uh, but I think yeah. we're only sending four of them. <laughs> and so <laughs> Ukraine needs everything they can get. But we have been a, a little bit in the mode of just trickling things forward. Uh, of course, the howitzers that have gone in, just from the U.S. alone, they sent about 120. Many other countries, including Australia, have sent uh, howitzers. And, of course, really every NATO ally and then about 15 countries that aren't even in NATO are sending security assistance to Ukraine to keep them going in this fight against Russia. Well, Putin evidently made a comment, um, I think it was yesterday, where, you know, if any of these rockets that we're sending over there end up being fired into Russia, actually, you know, dire consequences will come, you know, as a result of that. Do you, do you think that we would do anything along those lines? And what do you think that his retaliation would be? Yeah, right. He says that. Uh, he said that when we were thinking about sanctions. <laughs> Remember, yeah. you know, he says that every time. That is standard Kremlin propaganda. It's scary, of course, because Russia is a, a big nuclear power, and Russia was just crazy enough to invade Ukraine. So it's scary. But let's remember, it is. This is the Kremlin's attempt to scare NATO members and scare the U.S. into stopping the security assistance. You know, my view of this is that Ukraine, which has a a pretty hot fight going both in the east and even down on the southern front, they have plenty of targets in Ukraine, targets that are Russian forces in Ukraine uh, to hit. So I'm not concerned, and I don't see these, I do not see the Gray Eagle drone or the HIMARS or howitzers as escalatory in any way. You know, remember, big picture, you know, Putin's plan here is to stoke fears of escalation to get the U.S. and NATO to back off their support for Zelensky. So we always have to look at it in that regard as well. Well, I think he's, you know, 
And he's a bully, and uh, I, he doesn't like that people are pushing back so much. In fact, you mentioned um, earlier on, we were talking here with Dr. Rebecca Grant um, about what is going on in the Ukraine, about two more countries that are, you know, clamoring to join NATO. Astonishing. Finland mm-hmm. has an 800-mile border with Russia up in the north, and then just uh, next-door neighbor, of course, is Sweden. Finland beat the Soviet Union in the 1939 Winter War. In fact, that's where the term Molotov cocktail comes from. It was invented by the Finns. The, 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 uh, the, you know, the hand-thrown uh, right, Molotov the bottle, cocktail was the invented bottle, by bottle. the Finns during that war and named after the Russian Foreign Minister Molotov. Uh, and while we're on history, I want to point out that Sweden has been uh, neutral since 1814. And yes, you heard that right, 1814. They have not joined an alliance or been in a war. Finland has kept its neutrality after 1945. And they've both been good partners with NATO. But for these two nations to decide to join NATO is I just cannot over. It's epic. There, uh, six months ago, their public opinion poll said, "Nope, we're good. We love NATO, but we don't want to join." Now they are in favor, and it's because of the threat of Russia. So here is Sweden giving up 200 years of neutrality, and Finland giving up its cherished neutral stance. Remember, back in 2018, there was President Trump, Vladimir Putin, at a summit in Helsinki, Finland because Finland liked to try to provide a meeting place for both countries, that's over. They need to join NATO because of the threat of Russia under Putin. Just astonishing. Right. I, I think that I, I could understand all of those countries that are, you know, border on Russia or, or nearby would be af- afraid of, you know, if they do take over Ukraine, who's next? Exactly. And General Mark Milley, our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is actually in Stockholm, Sweden, this weekend for defense talks. And uh, just to point out that Finland and Sweden basically are already under NATO protection. And that's just the way the world it has to be. You know, the world is dividing into two camps, and Finland and Sweden want to be formally in the camp with the good guys. Okay. <laughs> Why, and, and, and can you talk just briefly about Turkey? They're, they're not too excited about, you know, new, two new countries, I think, getting into NATO. Turkey, two pieces of news. One is they're going to change the spelling of turkey so it's not turkey oh, like that. thanksgiving turkey it's going to be spelled so you emphasize it t-r-u-k-i-y-e uh, but they raised an objection to finland and sweden joining because finland and sweden had said nice things about the kurds and there's a dispute between the kurds and the turks it's been going on oh. a long time at the same time Turkey also mentioned that if a few export controls were changed so that Turkey could sell some of its military equipment, that might make it okay. So the deal has not yet been struck, and Turkey must agree because NATO must unanimously consent to approve Finland and Sweden's application. But the diplomats seem optimistic that they'll be able to work something out with Turkey. And Turkey is a very key NATO ally, of course, because of their control of the Black Sea. Right, and I and I saw that they were trying to work with, you know, the countries involved, so that maybe some grain could ex- be exported. Yes, the Russian Navy is blockading that final that that port of Odessa. Interesting, the whole NATO southern flank, I'm including here Romania, Greece, Turkey, all very concerned. Uh, you know, who buys the grain coming out of Odessa by ship is China. And also oh. Indonesia and a couple other purchasers, but the huge ships that come in and take just enormous amounts of grain in one go, that's mainly been Chinese shipping. So you can send grain other ways. You know, the U.S. and Canada, we move a lot of ours by rail and by truck, but it's just if you're used to sending it by ship, it's very hard and very expensive to reconfigure. So the Russian oh. blockade of uh, Odessa is uh, really creating a problem. There's a lot of grain stored there. And then by the time you put even, you know, this year's harvest will be smaller because they've apparently planted less. But by mm-hmm. the time you have this year's grain harvest in there as well, you've definitely got a problem. Wow. There's so much going on. <laughs> it's, we're, we're talking with Dr. Rebecca Grant about what's going on uh, in the world. And, the, you know, one of the other questions that, that uh, comes to mind 
was that you said there were major changes coming in Germany as well. Yes, and under the new Chancellor Olaf Scholz, we've seen changes in Germany that just um, you would never have anticipated. For example, the German public opinion is not happy with the Chancellor because they feel he's not sending heavy military equipment to Ukraine fast enough. Now, remember, it was very controversial for Germany even to send security assistance. There was a controversy when they said, well, they'd send helmets and body armor. But then they quickly decided they would actually send um, howitzers and tanks and other heavy equipment. And the German people want them to get it there just that much faster. There's also been an enormous change in Germany's energy strategy. As your listeners know, Germany is very dependent on Russian natural gas and oil and in fact, the European Union as a whole has decided to ban Russian oil imports. Oh, huge change. They've had to really scramble and get deliveries of oil from different sources. They're struggling to, to wean themselves off Russian gas in the pipelines at this point. But again, the fact that Germany has been willing to step up in sending military equipment and completely changing its energy strategy is, again, a sign of how serious the problem of Russia really is. It's having a huge impact on uh, the security of Europe. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's having a, certainly is having a global impact. I can't imagine, you know, if, it's, if gas is $5 a gallon here, what must it be in Germany? Yes, very, very high. <laughs> and likely to, you know, they're lucky right now that it's summertime and likely to go higher. So one of the key German strategies has been to try to get enough um, energy stored in Germany to be able to level things out and particularly keep up their industrial production. But it's an ongoing problem, and the, the European Union has agreed to yet another round of sanctions on Russia. Sanctions aren't going to do it. Putin's got to lose on the battlefield. But I'm glad to see the sanctions being put on his regime. Well, yes, and I'm glad to see the um, the unity, at least for now, of of all of the NATO countries that are sticking by it. That's that's kind of amazing too. Considering it's a NATO has 30 members, yeah. you know, any 30 members of anything, uh, they are doing very well, and so much better than the United Nations, which sadly has been sidelined in in this conflict. They were unable to pass resolutions. They were unable to do anything. You know, the, the Blue Helmets have done some good work over the decades in peacekeeping, but they've been no help to Ukraine. And the U.N. Secretary General has tried to intervene because of the grain export problem, but really that's the first time we've seen the U.N. up on the radar. I'm afraid to say that the Ukraine um, situation has pointed out how how powerless and, uh, and honestly how useless the United Nations is at this point in, in its security role. Well, I think you know obviously there's a problem with the, you know the, the, the vetoes that that Russia and China have over there. Um, it's yeah, it's it's not working very well. Uh, a quick transition, I guess you could say, since you were mentioning it about China not getting all of its grain. So what is China up to these days? Well, remember, China is backing Russia, although we hear reports that Xi Jinping and other Chinese leaders were horrified that this invasion wasn't done in three days, like Putin promised. And even that China is trying to not run afoul of some of the Western sanctions. But leaving that aside, it was China's agreement with Putin made during the Olympics, right, that um, that showed Putin that he could go ahead and do this. And China is backing him up by purchasing additional energy and, in fact, uh, even by purchasing Russian grain. Ironic, because China is actually a very big producer of wheat. Not all the other grains, but of wheat they are. And so they are definitely supporting Putin's ability to, um, to wage this war in Ukraine. A couple other things they're doing, of course, China remains the number one military threat. They are embarked on a massive nuclear modernization program. And, and of course, they won't condemn the Ukraine invasion in any way. They're trying to blame it on NATO. But here's the thing that, that happened this recently that really got me, and that is that China has made a, um, a big diplomatic agreement with the Solomon Islands and has... Uh, won some basing rights 
in the Solomon Islands, and of course that includes Guadalcanal. And having had an uncle who served uh, as a Marine, uh, you know, he flew from Guadalcanal uh, later, later in the war, but still, uh, I just, the fact that China has wormed its way into there with their infrastructure promises and their military presence, and they now are, uh, you know, are, are welcomed on Guadalcanal just, just is, it just hurts. Okay, well, I'm sure. It, and imagine you know, how much it hurts you. Imagine the other, you know, the other relatives of, of Marines that fought on Guadalcanal uh, as well, and that whole generation. You know, to, to, and anytime you give something back, it, it's it's not good. Right, it's and you know who else is mad about this is Australia. Okay, so the geopolitics are the same as during World War II, why we had to prevent, why we had to kick Japan off Guadalcanal, right, to keep the approaches to Australia. It's really no different. And Australia, who has had uh, some real difficult trade disputes with China, um, Australia has raised the fact that this is, you know, we can't have Chinese forces coming in and out of the Solomon Islands. I was amazed to learn that the Solomon Islands, now um, 800,000 people live there, very different from in the World War II era. But it just shows that we really have to keep an eye on the Pacific and that China's extension of its influence and its little island bases that they've built up on these little reefs is um, is really seriously becoming a problem. And pair that with their accelerated nuclear modernization, and no wonder the Pentagon says that China does remain the number one military threat. Well, we have a little minor threat out there because we always have to talk about North Korea. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so let's uh, let's see what they're up to there. Look for North Korea to be in the news all summer long. They have done several missile tests this year. They just launched eight missiles together. They were they were short range, unexciting un- missiles, but the fact that they did eight. Was it caught my eye because in the past they've only ever launched three or four together. But what we're really looking for is a test of a long range intercontinental missile. You remember Kim Jong un swore off long range missile testing back in November of 2017 and had kept that promise up until just this spring. But most concerning of all, the Asia experts that I know believe that North Korea is preparing for its seventh nuclear weapons test. There's a lot of activity at their nuclear weapons test site. Again, they haven't tested since the fall of 2017. And it's just very, very discouraging to see North Korea resuming its ICBM tests, uh, resuming work on submarine-launched missiles, and then possibly preparing for a nuclear weapons test. Very, very discouraging. Well, you know, the world is not the safest place to be right now, but it's all we've got. So we've got to, you know, try to keep all of these people at bay. I mean, it's, it's, this is like a juggler. And to keep our forces everybody. on the Korean Peninsula, their motto, fight tonight, you know, they are ready at all times to do that. Looking back, it's really a shame that, um, that the Trump administration wasn't able to make more progress with denuclearization. I think it was worth the try, <laughs> certainly. There was a time there that looked like he might just talk uh, Kim Jong-un into taking a different course. But at this point, possibly because uh, China is egging them on a bit, but we certainly see um, Kim Jong-un really going hard for improving not just his nuclear cap- like capacity, but some experts are talking about North Korea even aiming to establish at some point a nuclear Triad, air yeah, launch. I, I, I saw that in, yeah, in your notes to me, missiles, submarines, and aircraft, uh, all these little delivery systems. Yeah, that we don't want that to happen. That would be bad. They still need to, they still are falling short in testing in certain areas. But remember, the ICBMs are 1960s technology, and the more they test, the more they learn. Right, right. Uh, anything else that we need to to be concerned about right now? Oh my goodness! You know, I'm I'm very curious to see uh, uh, how things shape up um, in space. You know, our our U.S. space forces in its entering its uh, fourth year uh, as a separate service and starting to do some very interesting things. Basically, swapping out older, bigger satellites for smaller constellations. Of of, uh, of smaller satellites that are more able to withstand the threats. 
So we want to see that continue, and we want to see, you know, our defense budget is putting more money into research and development than we've seen in, in quite a long time. Um, the Biden administration has kept the defense budget fairly high, and I think that's good. Also, we are looking, of course, at Taiwan and yeah. whether China is going to make good on its pledge of reunification. The Asia Watchers say probably not this year before the big party Congress that China will hold in the fall. But there's no doubt that uh, Taiwan remains a bit under threat from China's growing military power. Wow. Wow. Well, it's, as usual, uh, Dr. Grant, you have uh, gotten us all caught up on what is happening in the world with a rational explanation of what everything is doing without all the, you know, all the emotion that can be tied to all of these things. So I want to thank you again very much for always you know, being there whenever I ask for help. And uh, looking forward to having you back again. And good luck with uh, with what is going on, it looks like, with uh, Fox News. Thank you, and thank you to all our veterans. Thank you. We'll be talking to you soon. All right. That's the program, folks. Um, next week, Jim Fasson will be here. And then, oh, I, I want to try and think. We've got a program coming up on Father's Day. And I want to talk to people about what did your dad do when he was in the service, whenever it was. So start thinking about that. If you follow us on veteransradio.net um, to get our newsletter and stuff, we're going to start asking questions on that. And um, so we want to thank you all for listening today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and keep those stories coming in to us. And Eric, how are we doing on time? Oh, we got 10 seconds. Okay. So we've been listening. You've been listening to Veterans Radio. This is Dale Thronberry. Until next week, you are dismissed. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.